Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for giving us the gift of your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come, and we pray with King David tonight. We say, open our eyes, Lord, that we may behold wonderful things out of your law. So, Father, would you just send your spirit now and just impress the truths of the word of God upon our heart this evening and bless our fellowship time as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last time we uh, covered a lot of ground real fast. We looked at the wars of Messiah and the millennial reign of Christ. And tonight we're going to go past that point into eternity future. Last time we saw how Christ would reign on the earth for a thousand years and there would be a wonderful Sabbath age. It's going to be a time in which Jesus is going to fulfill the many promises that God has made in his word to Israel that they will dwell in their own land with no one to make them afraid, as the Bible says. He's also going to fulfill the promises that he's made to the church, that we will have a reward for our love to the Lord, a reward for our service to him, and a reward for our suffering. But what happens after that? What happens next? Paul talks about it in terms of a transfer of authority back to the Father. See, during the millennial age, during the kingdom of Christ, Christ is reigning for the Father. But when all of God's purposes for the millennium have been fulfilled, Paul says that all sovereignty will be given over to the Father again. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die... Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, he says, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. In other words, God the Father is not putting himself under God the Son. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And we also touched on the fact there in Revelation 20 that God will allow one final rebellion. We talked about the fact that no matter what the conditions have been of man's environment, no matter what the external situation uh, of man's life, or no matter what the conditions or requirements of worship have been, how they've been different in the different ages of, of humanity, the problem has always been within the problem is always man's heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked above all things. And so even in those conditions, those garden-like conditions of the millennium, and even without uh, demonic temptation, and even with uh, the presence of Jesus personally there, men will still sin. And we saw how Satan will be loosed and deceive many people. We have very little information about that, but it ends in the final destruction of the devil and his servants. It says in Revelation 20, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Yeah, somebody, somebody just went, hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's scary up here too. What follows next is what we refer to as the great white throne or the great white throne judgment. And this appears to be a final and inclusive judgment which covers a few categories of people or a few different things. Uh, every person who had a natural body during the millennium. So we talked about the fact that there will be people who will go into the millennial kingdom in their natural body and they would be judged here. Also, every person who was not raised from death previously, such as the wicked dead from ages past before the millennium. 
And it's also very interesting that John says that death itself, remember the portion that we just read from 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about death being destroyed. And this is where death comes to an end. Even death itself, and John says even hell or Hades, which is the resting place right now of the wicked dead, even death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. What does that look like? I don't know and neither do you. But we have the detail. You know, I, I joke around about that in that way because I think sometimes the best thing we can do is, is, is kind of step back, pull out, and avoid speculations. People have gone to sometimes absurd lengths and speculations about things which the Bible tells us very little about. So sometimes the wisest thing you can do is not speculate. Just say, okay, God, I don't know exactly what that means or what that looks like, but, but you do. And if it says that death is cast in the lake of fire, God knows what that means. And someday when you're watching it from your seat over the railing, you'll see it too. But John says there, it's revealed to him that people will be judged at that judgment by the works that they've done. And of course, it's always instructive for us to recall that everything is recorded. He says, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of like life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is the last of all the judgments we read about in the Bible. And after this, uh, apparently there's no one else who's left in a natural body and there is no more sin or suffering or rebellion from this point. Now, John next sees a new heaven and a new earth. And there are a few interesting characteristics we can find from scripture, a few interesting features uh, about the new heaven and a new earth. I think really there are two main characteristics which distinguish the new creation. Let's call it the new creation, the new heavens and earth, that distinguish the new creation from our creation that we currently inhabit. First, in the new creation, there is permanent righteousness, permanent righteousness, and that's a good thing. Peter says in 2 Peter that we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And that's such an important word in that verse. See, at the moment, I think you would agree with me that righteousness does not dwell here on this earth. Righteousness uh, is mostly in this age found within some people. And it does make occasional appearances or outcroppings in the governments and systems of men, but it's usually not found there. Uh, but in the new creation, righteousness, goodness, justice, and love are a part of everything that happens. There's no sin, there's no Satan, there's no selfishness, but in the new creation, the love of God is really the underlying principle of everything that exists and everything that's taking place, and that is so different. Uh, from the creation that we now live in. The other distinguishing feature of the new creation is this, that in the new creation, God is fully present with his people. You know, uh, sometimes you're home and you're worshiping the Lord or you come to church and you're worshiping together with brothers and sisters and you say, wow, I just sensed the Lord's presence in such a powerful way today. Or when the pastor was, was preaching or when the worship was, was going on, I just felt the, the presence of the Spirit so powerfully upon me. But see, in the new creation, God will be fully present with his people. God is present with us there and you're going to enjoy perfect fellowship with him and he's going to enjoy perfect fellowship with the redeemed of all ages and with the holy angels. John says uh, from the beginning of Revelation 21, it says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle, which is the tent or the dwelling place, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Sometimes we say, right, we say, I know the Lord is with me. And we say that by faith because we're not able currently to perceive God with our natural senses. But when John says God's going to be with you, he means God's going to be with you <laughs> right there in a perceptible way. It says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I want you to know, church, I believe that that's not, you know, God is not going to send a million angels across the crowd to distribute Kleenex. 
that's going to be very personal and very intimate between you and the Lord who knows everything, who knows. See, David said that God had saved and stored and knew every tear that he had ever wept. And God's going to comfort you for all of the tears and troubles of this life. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Can you imagine never tasting any sorrow again? Even the little pains of life that we go through, the little separations of life um, that sometimes even seem silly to us. You know, we were never made for those kinds of things. And there won't be any more sorrow or crying. There will be no more pain. What is a more common feature of our life than, than pain, than physical pain? Is what he's talking about there, really physical pain. Especially as, as you age. It's, it's an everyday thing for our elderly friends. Why? He says, because the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make or I am making all things new. So we can see from Revelation 21 and 22, which are the last two chapters in the Bible, that God is going to make a perfect world, even more perfect than the world or the age of the millennial reign of Christ. Because in the millennium, uh, there might be sort of garden-like perfect conditions, but there's still some sin to be found in, in people and still some possibility of trouble. You know, it does say that Christ would rule the nations in the millennium with a rod of iron. But in the new Jerusalem, that will not be necessary. And in the eternity future, he's also going to bring that heavenly city here. And as we finish uh, this course tonight, I want to look at seven questions about the new Jerusalem and about our eternal state. John says that he saw the city coming down out of heaven. And you know, I don't think we can say that we really have the complete picture, of course, with respect to what that looks like or everything that takes place there. But I do think that we have enough detail, certainly from scripture, to get a little excited about it. And I do think when you read the descriptions, and I know many of you were reading along with us through Revelation, uh, I do really believe that God was trying to dazzle us with the thought of his presence and with the amazing environment that is awaiting us. See, the Bible says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men at any time the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And you know, that includes God's presence, and it also includes a wonderful and perfect and beautiful, loving environment as well. It's going to be good, Pastor Glenn. <laughs> First question, where is the New Jerusalem now? Well, I don't think we know where it is right now, but see, John saw it coming out of heaven. So if you want to be scientific, I, I don't think the heavenly city is currently in our space-time continuum for the Star Trek fans out there, so to speak. The amazing thing to me is that ultimately, mankind is not going to heaven. God's bringing his house here. And I think that's pretty cool. Jesus said in John 14 that he was going to prepare a place for us. And I guess he has been working on it for these 2,000 years. He said in his father's house, there were many dwelling places, many rooms for the redeemed of all the ages. John says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Isn't that awesome? Ladies, all of you that have been married, you know there's a lot of preparation and adornment and primping and preening and looking just so that goes into that wonderful day. And God is preparing a beautiful place for all of us, meticulously crafted for the pleasure and the enjoyment and the awe of the redeemed saints. Second question, where will the New Jerusalem be situated? Um, people ask sometimes uh, questions about the location of the New Jerusalem. Is it going to rest upon the surface of the earth? Uh, it's a city. Is it going to land upon the earth? I personally think, and, and you know, we're not told the answer to this, but I, I personally think the answer is no. I actually think it's too big to kind of sit on top of the earth. I think it's more likely that the New Jerusalem will, will rest above the earth at some distance, probably above, uh, I believe, the earthly Jerusalem of that time. The Bible tells us that God's people will live in Israel and in Jerusalem forever. So um, my opinion from the word is that the holy city will um, be above the earth, like a large 
large satellite or a moon, if you will. Uh, one question that people love to talk about is how big is it? How big is God's city, the New Jerusalem? Well, uh, you know, in the millennium, the renovated earthly Jerusalem is going to be very big, certainly. Ezekiel says that Jerusalem is going to be 4,500 measures on each side. Uh, there's a couple of different measurements as to what that measure could be. Uh, I think it's probably what they called, uh, what in English we call rods, about 10 feet each. And so the earthly Jerusalem is going to be about 50 square miles. So for purposes of comparison, I went to uh, Wikipedia and uh, said that uh, the city of Stanford is 52 square miles. So if you're from Stanford, uh, the millennial Jerusalem is about the size of Stanford. Town of Greenwich is 67 square miles. So um, the earthly Jerusalem in the millennium is about the size of a large town in the state of Connecticut. However, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, compared to that, or compared to anything, is absolutely enormous. It is the size of a small moon. Uh, John tells us, he says that the city is 12,000 furlongs on each side. He says the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. By the way, before we talk about what that means, remember what I, I said a few weeks ago about the number symbolism that fills the book of Revelation. Revelation is filled with number symbolism. And the number 12 symbolizes God's divine government, right? So you have 12 tribes, you have 12 apostles. So if you take that number 12 and you make it 12,000, you're intensifying the effect of that. So God's making a statement in the fact that the city, by his measurement, is 12,000 uh, on each side. It, it represents the fullness of the power of, of God's government. But what about the size? I don't know if you've heard this word furlong, but it's an old surveyor's measurement, and uh, it was an eighth of a mile. Now, the Bible translators use that English word uh, in order to give us their approximation of the size of the city. But furlong is an English word, so it's not in the Bible. It's the, you know, the New Testament, of course, was written in Greek, and the Greek is 12,000 stadia. Stadia it actually is the word where we get uh, our word stadium from, because the stadia was a, was a course that you ran around, and each stadium was about 600 feet. So it's 12,000 of those. So if you plug that, those numbers in and do the math, we could suggest that the New Jerusalem is about 1,400 miles on each side. It's a big city. So put this in terms of distances that we can relate to. This is about the distance from New York City to Key West on each side. It's a big city. It's about half the distance of the U.S. across. If you go from Washington, uh, D.C. to L.A., it's about half that distance. So this is an enormous city, and there's plenty of room for you <laughs> and plenty of room for the redeemed of all the ages, uh, not to mention the holy angels. Now, interesting, uh, we also want to recall that John says it's just as high as it is long. So God's got some tall buildings. Not only is it 1,400 miles square at the base, it's also 1,400 miles high. So uh, friends, if you're not a person who likes to take the stairs, you're going to be in trouble in the New Jerusalem. So no wonder you've got to have a glorified body to live there. So. So that kind of begs the question, what is the shape of the city? Very commonly asked and commonly debated question. What is the shape? See, God, uh, John gives us this interesting detail that the base and the height are the same, 1,400 miles on each side and 1,400 miles high. So the fact that you've got the same length and breadth and height leads us to think geometrically that it can only be one of two shapes. It's either a pyramid or it's a cube. Uh, I personally favor, uh, and we're not told, but I, I personally favor a pyramid because I think it's pretty neat. If God is seated on his throne at the very peak of the city, then from any place on the surface, you could look up and see God from wherever you are. And that, ju that makes sense to me. I also think about the river of God, which we read about, which flows out of the throne. And I think it, it makes sense that that would kind of flow down from the peak. That's, that's just my opinion. The Bible doesn't say. I think... 
I, I personally think it wouldn't be a cube for aesthetic reasons, but what do I know? I didn't, I didn't write it, and I didn't see it. But I think, you know, geometrically, I think those are, your, those are really your only two options. So how about the construction uh, of the city? Everybody's fascinated by the construction of the heavenly city, and for good reason. Uh, the New Jerusalem is the ultimate example of beauty and stunning brilliance. Uh, can you imagine a place where everything has been designed by God to display his glory. Now, we live in a world that was designed for that, but we know that, that beauty has been marred um, by sin and by aging and all those things. But imagine a place where everything has been designed by God to display his glory and where there has never been any sin, where there has never been any decay, anything to mar it or destroy it in any way. Next to seeing God himself, nothing will ever blow your mind like the sight of his city. And look at these highlights that John gives in Revelation 21. The wall, it's a pretty big wall. Um, there must be a lot of Italians in heaven. The wall is 144 cubits. That's about 210 feet. So that's a pretty high wall. And the wall is made out of jasper, which uh, jasper in the ancient world there, it's a precious stone. It comes in a few different colors. But um, some people do believe that what John is indicating here is diamond. So uh, pretty amazing to have a 200-foot solid chunk of diamond running around the perimeter of this thing, 1,400 miles on a side. There are 12 foundations of the city, and uh, John tells us that each one of those foundations is decorated with different kinds of precious stones. There's sapphires, and there's rubies, and emeralds, and amethysts, and uh, others that, you know, different types that aren't necessarily what we call precious stones, but also have great beauty. The actual city itself and the street are pure gold, John says, so that they're almost clear, actually transparent, it says in the King James, because they're, they're of such purity that the light of God can go through them. There are 12 gates, and each one of those gates is made out of a single pearl. So, you know, when you see in the cartoons, they draw the pearly gates. They're not pearly because they're, they have a lot of pearls studding them. John says that each gate is made out of a single pearl. Be careful, you go swimming. You do not want to run into that oyster. <laughs> but imagine what that would look like. You know, the, the lighting effect, when, when light hits a, a pearl and you get that beautiful iridescent sheen, what would that look like to see a gigantic pearl stone that was hundreds of feet across? How beautiful would that be to have the light of God hitting that? See, it has no temple, John said. There's no temple there because God and the Lamb are its temple. And he says it has no need for lighting because the glory of God illuminates it and the lamb is its light. Praise God. Who's permitted in the city and who is excluded? Well, who's going to be there? Those who have served God will be there. It says there will be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. But those who have lived wickedly and refused the, the grace of God, refused the salvation of God, will be excluded. It says, outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. If you want to understand all that, come back to the new class uh, in January. But... Uh, but how wonderful what, what John was told in Revelation 14. He says, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Church, it's worth it to serve Jesus. And you're going to be so glad for everything you did in his name and that day and in that time. What are we going to see there? Well, we have a few details about what's inside the city and what we're going to see. I want to tell you about three wonderful things you're going to see in the New Jerusalem. And they're taken from Revelation 22. The first thing John says you're going to see is a pure river of the water of life. I don't know what that looks like. I'm sure it's awesome. I'm sure it's beautiful. It flows, John says, out of the throne of God. And I'm not sure about this, but I think that this may actually be a manifestation of the presence of the Spirit of God flowing all around the city because it comes out of God's throne. The second thing that John says you're going to see is you're going to see the tree of life. 
It's going to grow in the street, he says, and it's going to grow on the banks of the river. Its leaves will be for the healing of the nations. That won't be necessary uh, if you have a resurrection body, but in the millennium, that will probably be needed for the people who still have a natural body. Now, how does that work and what is it? I don't have any idea and neither do you, but we're going to find out. The third thing you're going to see, and it's the best one of the three, is this. You're going to see the face of God and the face of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 22, 4, John says, and they shall see his face. Do you remember in John's first letter, he had written this, beloved now, and that means in the sense of already, now already we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. God's going to make you over into a brand new version of you that is full of his glory and able to tolerate being in his glory so much so that you can see God face to face and look him in the eye and have him wipe those tears off your face. That's the greatest blessing of all, church, that we shall see God face to face. I used to sing an old hymn, uh, you know, 100 years ago. It said, it will be worth it all. When we see Jesus, life's trials will seem so small when we see him. One look of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. And that is so true. And, um, you know, I can't think of a better way to end this course than by looking at the last things that God and Christ actually speak within the scriptures. So I wanna read these words, follow with me, and listen to these words and feel the weight of what I believe God is wanting to say to us tonight. These are the last words of the Father and the last words of Christ in the Bible. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then the remaining are the words of Jesus from Revelation 22. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. He who testifies to these things says, and these are Jesus' last words in the Bible, surely I am coming quickly. And John says, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. So praise the Lord. That's what I wanted to share tonight. And uh, enjoy your group time together and think about that. Thank you.